What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chasers. And before I begin, as I do every show, I want to give a shout out to my channel members. I want to give a shout out to any of you, Cedric Bowman, Truth7360, BK Born Shahid. I want to give a shout out to James Washington, Hostel ADEP, Seven Coast Dojo, Ronan Martin, Shop Talk Live, WPR1, Roguish the Billmonger, I Care, The Nameless Protagonist, Force Windu, Lady Miss Thing Green, BGS If More, and Marvin Battle. Thank you so much for your memberships. And you too can become a member of the Green Gorilla channel. All you got to do is hit the join button next to the subscribe button. Please share like the videos and also if you can if you haven't subscribed to the green gorilla channel subscribe to the channel man we're here putting in work we're trying to give you good information and that's what we strive to do here and so thank you very much sherrod martin i want to give you a, a special thanks for that uh donation that you gave me there my brother i really appreciate that I, you know every little bit helps also i want to give a shout out to consular murray uh for the donation and I want to give a shout out to Frame Runner 743 as well. So before I begin, and I, you know, I introduce my guest, but he's been on the show before. Uh, before I, I bring him on the show again, uh, I want to read a poem. And after I read that poem, uh, we're going to go segue into the main part of the show. But let me start off with this poem. I'm not going to say what the name of the poem is before I start in, but I know dog going to understand what the poem is. An old man going on a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing the sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fears for him, but he turned with safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again must pass this way. You have crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build you a bridge at the evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I've come, he said. Their follower after me today, a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that has been naught to me, to that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. <laughs> That's that bridge builder, baby. You better ask somebody about it. Rude, rude. Yeah, rude dog. Yeah, rude dog. I want to give a shout out to Masculinity and Movies, man. He's in the house and... uh He's making some good content, man. He's trying to rally the brothers to do something constructive, man, and try to implement some plans to uh, yeah, control, man. to control this wizardry that's going on out here. So I want to give a shout out to him. But let me share the screen really quickly. And uh, I want to let you know who I'm dealing with here, man. I got my man Sand Dog in, the, in the, his house. You know what I'm saying? So go ahead, Sand Dog. Tell me what's going on with you in the uh, UAE, man. How's the United Arab Emirates treating you right about now? <laughs> No, you know, it's about midnight, man. It's uh it's peaceful and it's quiet. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just here to, to groove with you and the good men that are here in the manosphere. And then hopefully, man, fingers crossed, man, my giants will do something tonight. Oh man, you <laughs> them New York <laughs> them New York. Yeah, giants. man, the New York football giants, man, and Danny Dimes I trust. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you you're a New York native, man, so you know. It is what it is, bro. You know, I, I used to be a St. Louis Ram fan until them jokers, man, went on to L.A. and broke my heart. You know what I'm saying? They were, yeah. they were the greatest show on turf, you know what I'm saying? But now they left and, man, became part of the Hollywood shuffle, man. You know? Yeah. It is what it is, yeah. man. But, you know, the, the what, what? go ahead, bro. No, I'm listening. No, but, you know, they left St. Louis because there were concerns about a new stadium being built. And, you know, the, the performance of the team, it kind of tapered off from the glory days of the greatest show on turf, man. And so, you know, Marshall Falk, Tory Holt, you know, 
It, it was just, a, it was like, you know, Isaac Bruce. Them, I mean, they did some wonderful yeah, things. Man. Isaac yeah, King, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So they were doing their Ooh, thing on that gridiron. You were old school, man. Kurt Warner, <laughs> baby. You know what I'm saying? I'm an OG, though. You know, you better ask somebody. I'll take you further back than that, man. What about old Jim Everett, man? <laughs> well, so, you know, I, hey, look, I ain't going back that far. You know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> but, you know, oddly enough, though, you know, right now, you got the Phoenix Cardinals, but at one point in time, man, the St. Louis they Cardinals were Louis. was the thing. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Stump Mitchell. Uh, Jim Hart was the quarterback. I mean, you know, it wasn't no Class A team, but at the same time, it still was the home team, man, you know? Yeah. And Deerdorf, and, you know, they went on to do other things in other cities. Thank you, man, Friday, for the, uh, the donation, my brother. I really appreciate that. But, um, uh, so anyway, man, uh, you know, good luck to you and your Giants, man. Um, <laughs> good luck to you and your Giants, man. So today, what we wanted to have a conversation about was uh, global white supremacy. You know what I'm saying? Because oftentimes we get kind of like locked down and checked into what's going on in our neck of the woods, and we neglect to see how this system is global, how the system permeates uh, you know, not just what happens to our lives here in the United States, but it also happens elsewhere, wherever African diasporites may exist. But not only does it just permeate the life of people of African descent everywhere, it also permeates all of the aspects of our lives. You know what I'm saying? And so that's what Sand Dog today is going to have a discussion about with me. Uh, and I'm going to put this graphic up. And because uh, Sand Dog can't, you know, he can't join me via StreamYard. He is joining me via Zoom, and so you know he's not. Uh, you know the names are not going to be up there, and you won't see activity. You know, being illuminated from a dot. <laughs> you know, with the voice expansion technology, where they got this graphic that like contracts and expands from the center, but. You know, you're just going to have to bear with us here because we're doing the best we can given the technology we have. All right. So uh, let me put this graphic up. I don't know if you can see it, saying, uh, saying dog, but uh, probably not because you're probably not even keyed into what I'm doing here on uh, YouTube. But I'm going to put this graphic up of this pie chart. OK, can everybody see that? I'm assuming that everybody can see that. So you got career, money, health and well-being, family and friends, romance, personal growth, fun and recreation, and physical environment. Right? So those are the like various sections of, of this pot. So kick, yes. the, kick the wisdom to us, uh, Sand Dog, and uh, you know you start off the conversation, and then we can build from there. And then if people okay. uh, actually want to have a discussion with us, uh, you know maybe perhaps a little bit later on, we'll drop the link, and then they could you know kind of ask you some questions if they want to. All right. Okay, real dog team, but like remember what we were talking about. It is kind of like uh, from our last conversation or what you made from the previous couple of videos, right? And so when you're talking about looking for a solution, right? And so when you're looking for a solution, you have to identify what the problems are, right? And right. so once you identify what the problems are, then you can set what your goals and objectives will be uh, in order to deal with that problem. And so what happens is, is that if you look at the manosphere, we have years and years of catalog information, right, that applies to all areas of life. Because remember, racism touches you in terms of personal growth, fun and recreation, physical environment, career, so on and so forth. So the idea is, is to identify the areas of life and then look at, okay, what will be your main and supporting efforts in terms of ultimately finding a solution, right? And where it impacts you. And so for me, what, what I would do, like, for example, like when you look at the chart, right? And I would start with, let's say, fun and recreation. And the funny part is, is that the things that we believe are fun and recreation are not necessarily so, because these things serve an agenda. So I mean, shout out to Walt Diddy, man. Like I said, a couple of days ago, man, if not yesterday, I watched one of his videos, man, and he gave me pure 
Holy Ghost when he was talking about how the manosphere needs to produce new and different types of content, right? And so when you look at Hollywood, when you look at America's first film, right, people go to the movies for fun and recreation. And the first film that came out was what? Birth of a Nation. Right. Yeah. And so during so you got to remember during, and what did birth of the nation show in that film? Right. It showed how black people were taking over the South, harassing white people. And, you know, if, if we weren't controlled, we would be a scourge that would drive America down into the ground. Right. And so one of the things that's needed in terms of us and black men is the ability to make our own films, our own media and to establish our own propaganda. Right. So so it's the same thing. So if you watch certain television, right, you think that all black people are gangsters, you know, Arabs are wealthy and lazy and everybody that's Asian, you know, knows Kung Fu. And this propaganda in this media also impacts our women and children. Right. So a lot of what dudes may complain about in the manosphere comes from the music itself. So if you get guys like Walt Diddy, uh, me, you, BGS, dudes that are older. If you go back into the early days of hip hop, the culture itself was consciousness, right? So when you talk about fun and recreation, when hip hop was being built. So when you was a kid, you felt very different when you heard Coogee rap, the streets of New York, or it's like the jungle sometimes to make me wonder how I keep from going under. And when we heard that music, those music, that music was cautionary tales, right? So yeah. you would hear Brenda's having a baby by Pac and be like, damn, I don't want to end up like that. Where some of the stuff that came out later felt more to kind of promote or push people, uh, you know, into dysfunction, right? And so out of New York City, like in the West Coast where you got NWA, out of New York City came the Native Tongue Movement with De La Soul, you know, the Jungle Brothers. And then, you know, you had what? We had X-Clan, right? You know what I'm saying? Van Glorious, right? Yeah. And so you had X-Clan and you had Public Enemy. And so at that time, consciousness, consciousness was our culture until it was infiltrated by a different medium or, or, or a different style of rap that changed it. So when we look at the things that we consider or that we think are fun and recreation, these things are actually serious, right? So they do everything from program to educate your women and children. So it is the same thing in sports, right? So if a, any young man who's played football or any sport will know that all sports are played from the neck up from the neck up. So before you get into your what your actual physical talent is, do you have the intelligence to understand the sport? Do I have the intelligence to understand blocking schemes, uh, pass protections, coverage, you know, audibles? Can I understand all these things and what they mean in order to physically perform the function, right? And so when you look at so when you look at the different areas of life and how white supremacy impacts it, so you have to remember, so for black men, there were a time where we were or where we're still denied these things, right? So outside of groundbreaking media like Black Panther and everything else, you still seeing black men having to fight to tell stories from a certain perspective, right? You know, having to fight that. So you got racism there. You still have black men even still fighting for opportunities and uh, other opportunities in sports and entertainment, right? So what we, so like I said, so, you know, the things that we look at that we believe are recreational are, are not even so. And then even then when you get down to the women and everything else, right? So if, if, if a young girl gets on TV and she turns on that television, you know, because remember, women aren't men, right? So you and I might have listened to Reasonable Doubt and be like, yo, that was cold, right? right. But a female listening to Reasonable Doubt might listen to that and find attraction, right? So we're listening to it and getting life lessons out of it. And they're listening to it and they might be getting something completely different. So you got the media, right? Nature versus nurture, right? So you have the media plus the immediate environment and all of these things go on to influence people's decisions. True indeed. But you know, the funny thing about that though is, I mean, when speaking about media, uh, because media is our primary uh, form of recreation. I mean, you know, most, most Americans watch television or they spend time on the internet or they listen to music. 
Uh, they play video games and things like this, but primarily that's how uh, people entertain themselves. It kind of passively uh, consuming images crafted and manufactured by people other than themselves. But you know, what's funny though is, and I, you know, I kind of wanted to ask you about this. I mean, there are several black men who, who own, uh, I won't say necessarily own uh, studios, but they own production companies and they're able to gain access to funds. But the media that they're pushing is not from, uh, you know, an androcentric or black masculine perspective. Like, wh what do you think accounts for that? Like, wh why are they consistently manufacturing images or producing images that work uh, for, for the predominant society at large and not, and not you know, kind of uh, crafting tales uh, from their own, you know, kind of like perspective of history. What, what, what do you think that's all about? Well, I, I think it, uh, one, I think it's a couple of things. It's a combination of, of ignorance. It's a combination of this is what makes money, right? Because again, you know, th there are brothers in the manosphere who are more competent about, you know, how that industry works more so than myself. But, you know, the assumption is, is that, because remember it, it with these studios, they're in it to make money, right? So you have you have the creators versus the guys in the suits, right? And so the guys in the suits have all their statistics or what they believe are statistics about what sells and what people want to see, right? So that's why Black Panther was such a shock because at that time, the conventional wisdom in Hollywood was that most people, especially on a global scale, do not want to see things with a predominantly black cast in it. So the fact that Black Panther would go on to outperform Star Wars The Last Jedi was a huge disruptor. It was a shock. Like I said, it was a shock to the system. Right. And then, you know, for like I said, and again, for black men who engage in that behavior, you, you got to remember a lot of people are operating off of different levels of consciousness. Right. And so. I think that my assumption is for guys of our consciousness who want to make, who desire to make the type of content that we would like to see, I think that in the industry, those men find it very difficult to get any traction or support or any funding. So even for me now, I'm a Patreon for something called Black Sands Entertainment. So it's like what I told you before. So before the Manosphere, you know, uh, again, because I'm a huge comic book nerd. So things like Black Sands Entertainment, uh, Unique Studios, which I think is based out of Ghana, and they make all the superhero sci-fi stuff that I'm heavily into. So those are the those were the types of entities that I was supporting or that I put my support in prior to, because again, you have, you have the need for that type of media. And so, especially like, so for the guys out of Ghana or Nigeria, they would have media where you would incorporate African folklore and mythology and everything into the story. Right. And so that way you're seeing, you're seeing in real time, um, you're seeing in real time your own history, your own people, which for a lot of people, right, it has a psychological effect to it. So if you look at like the Marvel Infinity War movie, you know, Thor died. He was reborn in a sun. And when he came back to Earth, when he beamed down to Earth, he came back with an axe. What god of thunder carries an axe? That's Shango, the Yoruba god of thunder. Right. And then even in Yoruba mythology, there is an Iron Man. Right. Because in West African history, as my understanding of it, they actually skipped the Bronze Age and went directly into the Iron Age. And they have a god, I believe his name is Olorun, and he is the god of iron and technology. Right. And so what happens is, is that when you when you look at Hollywood, like for people and that's what I'm trying to say. So for you have to be educated or conscious on a certain level to be able to see things, extrapolate information and interpret it. So for those guys that are, you know, that are putting out kind of like your standard, you know, stereotypical stuff, you know, more than likely mentally, that's where they are. OK, that's what well, that's that's it's a good answer, man. I mean, they can only put out what they know about. And they can only be yeah. a reflection of their consciousness. You can only you yeah. can only emanate what exists within. So yes, uh, and, and and if you are uh, you know part of the Hollywood machine, I mean there is a specific set of content that is more marketable and e is easy to push, and it's easier to get investors uh, to put out there and, and to get the green light as opposed to information that kind of puts back, uh, excuse me, pushes back against some of the predominant narratives out there which kind of stereotype 
and typecast black men in a negative light. But having said yes. all that, uh, so you want to talk about other areas on this pie chart? So you covered the fun and recreation aspect. Uh, you got some other things to say about other areas of this chart? Well, yeah. I mean, but like I said, again, because each area of this chart is a discussion completely all unto itself, right? And I mean, like, so even if you wanted to jump around on the chart, right? And so let's say, for example, you get to romance, right? And so, you know, again, when we came over as slaves, right? Again, many of us, if we said a thousand times, you know, on these platforms was that you aren't even allowed to get married, right? You have no control, like, over... Uh, establishing a family or given the opportunities and tools um, to control it in, in the same manner that other men have, right? To include the fact that you even had laws that prevented you uh, from mating with other groups of people, right? Up until the, the final decision, what was that, in, in 1967, I think it was, what the, the loving, the loving versus uh, the loving versus Virginia. And so so you, like I said, you have that aspect of it and then come and then comes back into it. Like what we were talking about before is the whole propaganda of it. Right. And so you have people thinking that in order to start a family that you need to be insanely wealthy. Right. That you need to be deep into the six figures. And all of these things are lies. Right. All of these things are lies. So when you talk about so when you talk about the idea of and when you talk like for romance, so romance is the beginning part of creating a family. And so when you look at everything that's out there or in the culture, you know, we're given, you know, through racism, you're given a lot of unrealistic ideas like how they, we talk about the myth. Um, we talk about like the myth of white womanhood from BGS and ironically so. Like you'll see, and again, it all comes back to media. It's strange because I've seen a lot of black women actually quote, uh, what was the character's name? Scarlett O'Hara, if that was her name. I'm trying to remember in, in terms of Gone with the Wind. And so, you know, so when you get into, so for black men individually, right, we were not able to establish families. We were not able to, you know, engage in the factors of production, the things that allows you to establish patriarchy. So when you talk about um, romance, you can also tie it into family and friends and physical environment, right? Because when you look at this pie chart, right, a lot of these things, one thing leads into another. So when you look at things like romance, money, career, et cetera, all of these things are the things that allow you to control a physical environment, right? And so, and so because racism, so when you look at racism or, or global white supremacy, you know, you've been limited in that, even in regards for us here, even in regards to us marrying our own women, right? And I think so there was a time period, I think, and, and, and other brothers who are historians could correct me. So there was a time period where you have a lot of black men uh, who fled slavery, who are marrying indigenous Mexican women in, in the southern part of Texas, right? And they were and they were establishing and, and building communities there, you know, to you know, in order to kind of get away from the the prejudice and the racism that they were facing. So. You know, just going into the pie chart, and I, I, I'm going to slow it down, not to sound confusing, but the thing about it is that, again, it affects all areas of life. And I think, and it's my belief that our solution is to, in an organized fashion, actually look at the areas of life in which this phenomenon called racism or global white, global white supremacy impacts back black men. And then you work it, like I said, you work it backwards in terms of how you got into the situation and then ultimately uh, what the solution would be. Right. And so like, you know, when we talk about like just jumping on the chart, when you talk about physical environment. Right. And people talk about like your your Ray Rays and Pookies. Well, when we were slaves, our overseers were the Ray Rays and Pookies of their environment. Right. You are, you know, when we were picking cotton. Right. Voltaire and Socrates were not the people watching us work. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, they had uh, <laughs> you know, so, uneducated yeah. and ignorant they, in men who uh, and women who were charged with the responsibility of uh, making us work as uh, laboriously as possible and uh, expeditiously as possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Correct. And so, like I said, and so when you, and so, like I said, so when, when people want to diss the, the black proletariat, so if you took all of these things and propaganda, because you were talking about, again, in a ritual fashion, what is the one thing that a lot of black men share in common? One of the things is sports, right? And that's what I'm saying, in terms of claiming your own institutions, right? And some of the things that are happening, look at Deion Sanders going down to Jackson State University, right? Or, or the push or the push now to get more black athletes to come into or, or to come into HBCUs. So the disruptor of Deion Sanders and Terrell Owens and others going down there to Jackson State is a disruptor, right? Because, you know, so although Jackson State doesn't have the same money to recruit like other people that's in that environment or other SEC teams, Deion Sanders in himself is a draw, right? right. So let's say through some, and let's say, Right. I'm not going to call it a miracle, but let's just say that if if Jackson State being coached by Deion Sanders consistently beat SEC teams like Alabama or Arkansas, you know, or, or Texas A&M. Right. <laughs> then then that may be that may be a catalyst or something like that that pushes people um, to go, like I said, to, to go into HBCUs. And so when you so for these guys that are called. Ray Ray and Pookies and all that stuff, you know, you got to remember, right, before the government touched it, right, you know, the, the Black Panthers ended up being, well, when the government touched it, the Black Panthers being broken up, ended up getting broken up into what we now call street gangs, right? So your Crips, your Bloods, your Pyru, and all of that stuff, th those are the types of things that you will want to take back and gain control of where Black men could have a ritual, right, that would that would unify them or give them a common experience. And then on the academic side of the house, because you got to remember, we all experience racism based upon your socioeconomic status, right? So what happens is sometimes I think that black people forget that we're not necessarily a monolith, right? Right. right. So, so for somebody from the hood, you know, racism is the asshole cops that I deal with, right? And then from somebody from corporate America, it's it's the bureaucratic games that are played, right? So the guy from corporate America, the guy from the guy who got to corporate America may tell the black guy on the street, well, hey, you know, I wear a suit and tie every day, my pants don't sag off my butt or whatever, you know, and when the cops see me, they don't bother me. So, you know, what you're what you're doing is something self-imposed and you're doing that to yourself right and then the guy from the street is like man you have no clue what you're talking about so i think that if you took something like this pie chart and we were able to academically identify identify how racism impacts you in all areas of life this type of information is something that will probably give african americans black people whatever you want to call us this type of information could be used to give us a common ground or a common standing uh, in regards to this problem. Because since we're not a monolith, a lot of us experience this pie chart in many different ways. Right. Okay. So that makes sense. So one of the things you said was you can't just look at one area on this chart in isolation from other areas on the chart, because one area might have an impact on all of the other areas and vice versa. And so, therefore, yes. it's, it's, it's kind of useless to just look at one aspect of it and, uh, uh, you know, kind of just pay attention to it by itself, like a nice and, and, and neat little tidy package. Uh, but we are doing analysis and analyzation, which is, you know, splitting things apart before you put them back together. But uh, but but in the real world, things don't work uh, isolated from other things. Things have an impact on the other thing. So it's like if something happens to your foot. You don't notice it until something happens to your foot and then you notice how uh, it has an impact on how you walk and what's going on with your legs and your arms. You know what I'm saying? So Correct. Uh, yeah, so, you know, it's just important to know how things operate synergistically as opposed to uh, just independently and uh, isolatedly. Um, but, man, so so what about health and well-being, man? You know, like one of the things that global white supremacy does is it has a deep and a profound impact on people's well-being and uh, specifically black men's well-being. And one of the things that I highlighted on uh, another of my shows, I think it had to do with uh, my presentation on uh, 
wealth and uh, how black men are targeted and how it's almost inescapable. Because one of the things that I realized as I looked uh, at the empirical research, and uh, this was research that was provided and made available by Dr. Tommy Curry. One of the things that he articulated was, was that even when black men are able to be successful within the context of the corporate world or in the military or in the academy, they still uh, go through a profound sense of depression, anxiety and, and the like. So, and then on the street level, you know, of course, there's a uh, stress related to, to violence, there's stress related to uh, the consumption of, you know, bad food products, because primarily black people who live in these ghettos live in food deserts. And then, you know, we don't yes. have the, the best uh, health care. And then oftentimes we shirk, uh, you know, uh, looking after ourselves because we feel like we got other people to look after. And uh, oftentimes the depression that we do face, we consume uh, intoxicants in order to try to escape from, uh, you know, the rigors that we experience in our culture. So just give us some remarks, kind of, you know, if you can, about health and well-being and what we can do. And then also it's, it's important to understand it, you know, that health and, and well-being component also entails mental health as opposed to just Correct. physical health. Yeah, just physical health. So go ahead and kick some kick some knowledge to us, if you will, about that. Yeah, like, so it, it's funny you say that because, again, I was talking to one of my white colleagues and he was talking about, like, the stresses of the day and people losing jobs and, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and dealing with these things. And I said, listen, <laughs> I said, you know, because we were talking about suicide rates and I said, my grandfather and his fathers before him, right? Not only did they deal with that, but they dealt with a society that didn't want them. And eventually things like high blood pressure and strokes and everything else took them, like I said, took them off this earth. And so at the end of the day, there was no understanding for them, right? They just had to, they just had to deal with it or cope with it, you know, the, the best way they could. And I think I think that, you know, for us as men, that was a culture that was just handed down, right? That some way, somehow you need to find it work. You need to find a way to make it work and you need to find the answers to work. And this is not, again, this is not necessarily true right there. I've lost, just to let you know, I lost five friends, four friends and one soldier to suicide. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so I, I lost four friends. I lost four friends and one soldier, and one of them being a tail from my line. Oh my right? God! You know what I'm yeah, so you know, say so again, so that we lost, and so I, what happens is is that with black men, it, and here's the problem, and I discovered this in my first relationship, and it's only the mercy of God in which I got out. And what happens is is that for a lot of black men, you actually end up being mired. Because when I would go home at that time in my life and argue with my significant other, she would make some of the same, she would make some of the same accusations about me, right? That I would hear at work, right? From, like I said, from, from my white counterparts, right? If I, you know, in regards to, let's say, my quote unquote personal feelings or what she deemed was inadequate. Right? right. And so for a lot of guys, if you're not prepared to deal with that, you'll end up in the space of hopelessness. Yeah. Right. And yeah. there and there aren't any services that there, there aren't any services that exist, at least to my knowledge, that <laughs> you'll say that necessarily that will help black men um, that will help black men out of those circumstances. Right. So. If you're if you're going to work and you know you got somebody at work telling you you ain't nothing, and then you go home and you hear you ain't nothing, that takes a toll. Yeah, you know uh, one of the things I wanted to say about relationships, and I think you know this has to do with global white supremacy, and it has to also do with Western culture in general. Because and thank you T Fitness for you for the donation. I wanna I wanna uh, give give an acknowledgement of that. How you doing also, Kendra? What's going on? Last Breed, Shop Talk Live. How y'all doing out there? But um, one of the things that, you know, uh, our culture consistently pushes uh, is this notion that relationships are supposed to be centered around personal happiness and, uh, you know, that they're supposed to always be uh, seated in blissfulness, uh, particularly man's ability to cause bliss for his woman, 
You know what I'm saying? Like it's, you, you're, you're supposed to be able to provide uh, a life of relative comfort and safety for her. Uh, and, it, you know, relationships often, they just end up being, uh, uh, you know, uh, they end up being articulated as a way in which a man can please a woman. And when that's done, people lose sight of the fact that a relationship is so much more than just an extension of either person's happiness because it's the main way by which values are transmitted from one generation to the next. And, mm. and, and then not only that, you know, I think that, you know, this idea that everybody's supposed to be happy and that everybody is an individual and they have their own life plan. And, it, and, and if you buy into that notion of what a, if that's what a relationship is actually supposed to be about, and that's the extent of it, like this personal euphoria that you feel, this kind of blissful uh, stage where you first meet and then you're supposed to be able to sustain that kind of, you know, that, that, that kind of phase of the relationship throughout the entirety of it. Then you lose sight of the fact of what the relationship actually is supposed to be about, which is the extension of yourself into another person in order to instill values to future generations. You know, so what do you what do you think about that? Because, you know, oftentimes what men end up trying to do is trying to make women happy at the expense of themselves and they end up losing themselves in the context of the relationship and then they're not able to actually achieve other goals beyond the context of the relationship itself which is responsible for being able to draw in the woman in the first place <laughs> yeah. but you know? You, you know it's funny because you know it, and, and the reality that i have to that is that i believe that there are things that we can borrow from other cultures right so i have extended indo pak family Right. And it's so funny when we when, when we sit down with them and we talk about marriage, they make a distinction about marriage in terms of mate selection. So they have loved marriage and then there's arranged marriage. Right. So the love marriage, as they call it, is how people fall in love and get married in the Western sense. Right. And then the arranged marriage is more of the traditional stuff. Uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, the kids get the court, uh, you know, they get to court each other and discover if they like each other or not or want to pursue marriage. And then, you know, at that point the families and everything gets involved. So in terms of okay, you know, do the, you know, how do we get along as a family? And then at that point, you know, there's, you know, there's even discussions about business, right? You know, depending on what level of life that you're on, right? So there, there's discussions about business or how they're going to make moves together or, you know, what's going to happen when these families unite. And so it, it goes back to what we said before was that you have to have the understanding of purpose, right? So the whole idea that you're going to get married and live in a rom-com for the next 50 years is something that's not practical. Right. So that relationship, that relationship is going to need a long term goal. It's going to need things other than love. So whether it's, you know, again, so you have a combination of children building businesses, you know, uh, building businesses, the exchange of wealth or property, you know, however, you know, however people uh, use marriage and what it's for in the traditional sense. And so I think that in the West, that we have gone too far uh, in one extreme as it pertains to marriage. And so this is where a lot of people find themselves in trouble. And this is where a lot of people may, may, may more or less make uh, not the best decisions and make selection. So from my perspective, I think that, you know, as us Muslims say, right, the best path to walk is the middle path. So I think that between what people still do in the East and what we have in the West, if you could find a middle ground, I think that's a better solution. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, this is my message for the ladies out there. You know, uh, if I had to say anything to them, I would just say that if the entire world is supposed to bend to your will and that's what the man is for, for you, you're going to end up destroying that man. Because you should have a goal that extends beyond just your own individual personal happiness in the context of a relationship to begin with. Because it, it can't just be about any one individual because it's a relationship. You have to exist side by side with that other individual. But you yeah. can't really exist in harmony with any individual if it is the case, <laughs> you know, that you feel like there are certain things that have to be done for you and by you as if a man is a satellite to your ego. That's why it's yeah. important. That's why it is very important 
for you both to have if you're engaged with a man or, or you're related to a man in any kind of uh, romantic or any kind of institutional way that you have goals that you're working on together and you're tracking the progress uh, in the achievement or attainment of those goals. Otherwise, you'll get distracted and get mired in the pettiness. And most of the time, yeah. arguments between uh, partners, they start off with pettiness, you know, and, and, and little miniature and insignificant slights. Right. And then, you know, then resentment, which is the remembering or recalling of a negative emotion, gets built up like a snowball. And then you end up getting, you know, this this uh, uh, release. And it, and it often comes at the wrong time and at the wrong place. But, you know, yeah. and it goes for men. And women. I'm, yeah, that goes yeah, for men and you, women, though. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm listening. No, no, I was just saying it can happen to both men and women, though. I mean, you know, it. it you got to have goals that exist outside of the context of the relationship that you're working on building together. And sometimes that yes. will require you to be apart. Sometimes it'll require you to be together. Sometimes you'll have disagreements. But the whole point is you got to have things that you're working on other than emotional euphoria. Like you said, like a rom-com kind of situation, because that's. Come on, man, that's quixotic. That's all based upon or predicated upon romantic notions that were developed within, you know, Western culture and even in Arabic culture, right? Because Arabic culture was the uh, uh, the culture in which these romantic stories had first evolved. But I, I don't want to yeah. get into, I don't want to get into a historical, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, because I'll tell you something crazy, and and you know, Kendra is listening. So I'm out one time. I have like a kind of like I told you, I have adopted you know, extended Indo-Pak family. So I'm out with one of my little sisters, and so she's getting ready to finish college. And I told her, you know, what do you want in a husband? And so I started asking her and I started giving out all of these physical attributes. And she goes, well, that's nice. But what's important first is that one, he's a pious Muslim. He is he doesn't have to be rich, but he must be responsible. Right. He must be fiscally responsible, responsible for himself, his health and everything else. And so she had listed a series of values that the man needed to have before she got into anything physical, right? So, and, and for me, it, it, like I said, I was blown off my seat because again, and, and and it wasn't, and like I said, it wasn't these insane things like, you know, you need to be an NFL linebacker and you have to make $7 million a minute. You know, her thing was, okay, look, you know, he is, he is a, he's a devout Muslim, right? You know, He's able to, he has the life skills to look after himself, you know, and to look after me. And he needs to be honest, trustworthy, and responsible. The end. Right. So not yeah. a lot of material, uh, you know, uh, idealization, but more so qualities and characteristics and, uh, you know, markers of virtue that were, yes. that were important. Yeah. But, you know, that's kind of like the opposite of what we do in America. I mean, because American society, I would just argue in general, it's just superficial and it's all predicated upon material consumption. You know, so a lot, yes. of, a lot of people think that, you know, uh, successful uh, people just have a lot of things when, uh, you know, it's not all about the acquisition of material objects. It's, it's about the accomplishments of goals. And, and it's not just about you and your individual life, but it's about the legacy you build. And the kind of institutions uh, that you attach yourself to that can help future generations. That's why I said that bridge building poem, because it's not just about you. It's about what you leave for others for posterity. Right. Yes. So. And uh, again, I got my brother Sand Dog here. He because uh, Kendra is asking, who are you? Who is this brother? And uh, let the people know exactly who you are again, Sand Dog, so that they have no uh, misunderstandings about you. Uh, your level of education, your uh, uh, career, vocational experiences, and why you uniquely are, uh, you know, qualified to speak about these kinds of issues. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Well, just to let you know, one, and then for, for Kendra, like I said, I'm also a fan. And for Kendra, I'll say salam alaikum. I, I am also Muslim. I took my shahada uh, in 2012. Um, like I said, I'm from the East Coast. You know, I went to school, HBCU, you know, I studied finance. After that, I was a commissioned officer. Uh, I was a Buffalo soldier. Uh, I led, I've led as an officer. I've had the opportunity to lead men into battle. 
So I, I, I fought a couple of battles for what that's worth. And then before I left the Army, I had the opportunity to work uh, in general staff and pretty much I was engaged in campaign operations from the Horn of Africa through the Middle East all the way out to Pakistan. And then since then, I've been, um, you know, again, I've been between, I've been in and out of Africa and Asia, engaged in the logistics and trade. And here I am before you guys now. And, you know, it sure is a pleasure to be able to have you on the show uh, to get your insights about various things. Uh, you know, it, Yesterday, you know, I kind of went on a rant and, and, you know, I had a lot of fun with, you know, talking reckless and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, I'm not always that way. Sometimes it's time to be sober minded and to get serious. And so, yeah, that's the kind of conversation we're having today. Um, yeah. Now, and much respect for your service, much respect for your experience, much, much respect to your skills. And then also respect because, you know, one of the 20, but I ain't going to even get into all that. Rude. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm an eight. Huh? I'm an eight, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah. um, talk about family and friends because you know, growing up uh, under white supremacy as a black person, whether you're male or female, you know, uh, your family is, for all intents and purposes, kind of managed by the superstructure, uh, and and can be deeply impacted in, in adverse ways that, that, that we can't really see. So what do you think about family and friends under the context of global white supremacy? Like, and, 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 and this is where it gets crazy, right? Because it's all, like I said, it's all tied in together, right? So for example, like I joined the army, right? And so the rhetoric from family and friends at that time in my life was like, why would you join the army? You know, said, so, you know, there's no place for you. There's no place for you in the army. But the life experience and the skills that I obtained while I was in the army, I wouldn't have never gotten uh, anywhere else. Right. And so when you talk about things like family and friends, like to your very point, right, this superstructure or this superculture, it kind of dictates to you it kind of dictates in a sense like, you know, not only how your family is structured, but also what you believe. Right. And so for some of us, so for some of us, that may impact us in many different ways. Some of us may take these more or less conservative narratives and run with it. Right. And then there'll be some of us that'll look at these other narratives and say, that's unrealistic or it's not for me. So I like, think like so like what we said, how important propaganda, filmmaking, art is and all of this. When you look at family and friends, let's turn back the hands of time. Let's look at the Cosby show when we were all kids. Right. How many people said it was unrealistic? So there were those of us who looked at the Cosby show and said, finally, we have positive representation. Right. And then there were other people that looked at the Cosby show based upon their own experience who said that this is like I said, this is an unrealistic uh, interpretation or expectation of uh, uh, of black people. And then also from Bill Cosby. Right. You know, if a lot of us because for me growing up in the hood, I didn't know any college graduates. My 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 people were were blue collar people. I had. <laughs> zero idea and then all of a sudden a show came out called the different world right and then that show is what made me is what made me you know want to you know want to go to college and then go on and do the things that i did and so when you when like i said so remember how we said that you can't talk about any of this stuff in, in isolation because what people are seeing in their immediate environment um, or, or what people's direct experiences are, are going to interpretate what their idea of, of what their idea of, of family and, and friends are. And which is why, again, when you're, you know, when you're vetting somebody, you know, r remove the whole player player thing and all of this stuff. So even when you're vetting somebody, like in terms of marriage, their upbringing and their life experiences are also things that you need to also things that you need to take into account. Right. So if you if you grew up, if you you know, if you got a girl that grew up all Rudy Huxtable and everything else like that, you know, she may have to think or or heavily weigh her options about marrying somebody who grew up in the completely opposite opposite circumstances. 
right? So there might be a lot of so there might be a lot of physical chemistry there, but all the things that she may be looking for in terms of uh, raising or grooming a family that other person may not have, right? And so when you look at and like I said, so it, and I'm sorry if I'm jumping a bit. So even if you turn back the hands of time, right? When when you go back into when you go back into slavery, there are a lot of things that our families carry from those things. Uh, internal, like I said, internal sexual abuse, physical abuse from children. So, you know, just now recently, a lot of black people are starting to get the ideas that there's a better way to communicate with the child as opposed to just beating the hell out of them, right? So, so when you're looking at people who are Gen X or millennials having kids, you know, they're starting to transition into new thoughts or new ways of parenting. Whereas for us, you know, it was a slipper, a skillet, an electrical cord or whatever they can get their hands on. Right. Because, you know, because that was the way of the plantation. Right. If something doesn't work, you beat it until it does. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and just thinking about discipline along the lines of physical discipline, you know, uh, one could argue that, you know, in terms of, Black families, we, we go a little bit overboard in the way we discipline our kids uh, as if we're going to beat the evil out of them. Uh, and there's a, a scholar by the name of Stacy Patton, and she does work on uh, discipline and spanking and how uh, it has an adverse effect and impact on children. Because when you when you when you train a child or discipline a child to try to, you know, uh, modify a child's behavior. Uh, with spanking, that lasts a lifetime. I mean, you can't you can't lose those kinds of impressions, especially at the formative uh, ages of your life. And so, those kind of impressions become part of your psyche, and then unconsciously, people play those kind of things out in the context of even their adult relationships. You see what I'm saying? And so, that's just something to think about, brother. Uh, yeah, yeah, but but that but you know, but this is what I'm trying to say, and like. And, and, and for me, I, I know, uh, I know, GG, like it's a loaded thing and I'm kind of jumping and I'm kind of jumping from one thing to the next. But the thing about it is that it's like I said, again, when we talk about build, what, what are entrepreneurs, ultimately entrepreneurs are nothing more than problem solvers. Right. So, <laughs> hey, I, I found a need and here's and like I said, at the end of the day, here's the solution. So when, when you look at us as a whole, as a people with all the data that that's coming from people like yourself, BGS, Kendra, you know, how do you organize it and catalog it, right? How do you organize it and catalog it where you could actually find uh, the, the cures, uh, the overall cure for the condition that we're in, which won't happen overnight. As BGS said, and my dad used to say the same thing, right? A lot of black people, all of us, myself included, need to be on somebody's couch. Right. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Goshen. I really appreciate your contribution, yeah. man. I really, I really appreciate that, brother. Yeah. Um, so, um, I, what I like to do is, you know, I like to also talk about personal growth because, you know, global white supremacy has a deep impact on the personal growth and development of uh, of, of us all. And uh, tell us yes. some of the ways that you think that white supremacy stifles or or, or halters. Uh, our ability to to grow into and develop into the kind of men that you know everybody in the community would be proud of. Yeah, well, but you know, as a black man, the system doesn't see the need to invest in you. Right. Right. And so, and so, this is something. So, this is something that grows, or, or that grows into all other levels of, of our society. Right. Because at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day. Well, geniuses aren't made, they're created, right? So, so like I said, so when you look at the edu so when you look at the education system, right? So before we, you know, back in the day when we had separate but equal, right? It was anything but separate but equal, right? And then as a result of it, what happened? Like what you were talking about in terms of losing culture. So what happened? So before we could actually create our own culture, you know, we went and ran across the street because the ice was colder. Um, you know what I'm saying? Because the ice was colder across the street. And then just recently you had like the CEO of Wells Fargo, you know, getting getting smoked because he said that it's very difficult for him to find black talent. 
right? But what they don't tell you is that the dark secret is, is that a lot of the guys who will be successful in the corporate world or in the military, they're groomed, right? So there's somebody that will see potential in them, wrap their arms around them. Like I said, wrap their arms around them and assure that they're successful. Right. Because no man, no matter how successful he is, makes himself. So this whole argument that I made it on my own or pulled it up by my bootstraps is complete crap. So when I was in the army, I was fortunate enough for for a, uh, for a senior officer to look at me and go, you remind me of myself when I was young. Right. You know, and then they'll touch you on the shoulder. They'll put you know, they'll put their arms around you. And then, you know, there you have it. So for me, like, especially for us, and you got to remember, a lot of black men, uh, unfortunately, like you said, what can we do to give us a ritual or to connect us or to network us? So for you and I, we're fortunate because we are a part of a vast organization, right? right. So the instant, so the instant I set foot into the army, <laughs> I had a bunch of people waiting on me to help me to ensure that I was successful, right? Whereas for a lot of brothers, they don't, like I said, they don't, they don't have that. They don't have, like I said, they don't have people or, or that mentor or that magical God or that fairy godmother to point them in the right direction. And you know, that's so true, man. Uh... And that's why I read the bridge building poem at the beginning of the show, because, you know, oftentimes we get caught into this 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 way of thinking that it's all about me uh, and it's all about my attainment, my, uh, you know, shine, my uh, improvement and my development. But without helping others, what is it all for? And then without being able to keep it going and for it to grow and, and to develop into something that extends beyond yourself, it still doesn't grow. It ends with you, right? So yeah. why would you want to have success? And why would you want to, you know, like John Henry, push your way, mire your way through uh, a whole bunch of hostility and, and, and a whole bunch of, uh, of hardship only to have all of that effort lost at the end of your own life or the end of your own career? It's 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 like a waste of effort, <laughs> you know. Then you then the next person yes. has to come along and reinvent the wheel, and then you wonder why black people aren't successful in a whole variety of domains. It's because we're not, you know, extending those kind of helping hands out to people. And then when you do mentor someone, you get to leave your imprint on that individual, and then there's a legacy created, and that's what you want. You want a legacy. That's what men. Yes. That's what men do. They create legacies. Right. And so that's just part of personal development and growth, not just your own development, but also being a bridge builder and uh, helping others so that they can also uh, grow and develop and then help the next one. You know, correct. Well, I just wanted to say it's not just altruistic. It's self-help, because when you develop and groom somebody, that person is helping you as an apprentice, so to speak. <laughs> you know, but at the same time, there's a it's a mutual and a reciprocal uh, kind of uh, exchange there. It's not just you're just helping and there's nothing received because you get veneration, you get honor, and then they help you perform your task as you teach them how to perform the task that somebody taught you. So, that's, correct. Yeah, that's. I mean, it just it's the same thing through through uh, through pledging, bro. It's like you don't know anything when you come into the organization, even while you pledge the organization, you don't know anything about what it's like to be on the uh, other side of the organization. That's when the real- Correct. Yeah. <laughs> that was the, what they say, that was the easy part. <laughs> right, but, but it seems like the most difficult ordeal in the world, but like the real work begins after you're actually, uh, you know, across the burning sands or what have you. So, uh, but, but it's the same thing with any endeavor in life, you know, uh, and, and that's, I mean, we need to be part of each other's development and growth. Development and growth doesn't happen apart from other people. That's the, I mean, that's the context in which, uh, you know, that needs to be, uh, uh, you know, elaborated and, and, and brought to light. Um, this money thing, bro, you know, this money thing, man, you know, a lot of us, <laughs> yeah, you know, so money and career kind of go hand in hand. Um, and so, you know, but, if you could say some things about that. 
Yeah, but th- I mean, but that's it, right? Look, it's all tied together. So let let's let's go back and play our cute little Jim Crow games, right? So at the end of the day, right, you you are a victim of capitalism. Capitalism is preached, but you're not able to participate in it, right? The, it was Martin Luther King who said that the Negro lives on an island of poverty amidst the sea of material prosperity. I don't know if I'm saying it correct, but it was. It was something. Uh, it, it, it was something in that direction, and so when you when you look at like the Jim Crow games, things like being dispossessed to build new highways or or redlining, especially you know the big story in terms of what happened to African Americans in Chicago with their housing scandals and everything else, you know, done like I said, done through racism, right? So you know, I would okay, or I would charge black people higher rents. Or if I did give them loans, I would charge them a higher interest rate, and then I would then take that money and then invest it in the community on the other side of town in order to build it up, right? Right, right. And so so you have that external part of it. And then again, like I said, without our our own propaganda, because remember, economics is a social science on how people deal with money, right? So they had, remember that whole concept that they had that selling to the Negro, right? So you have, so there was a time for us where we thought, well, if we had the same education and lived in the same nice houses and drove the same big cars and wore the same nice clothes, we'll be treated with respect, right? And so so the idea was that, hey, I'm, I'm thinking that if I am, if I have the same material things as the guy across the street, he'll now start to see me as his equal, right? And we will, we all ultimately will find out that this isn't true, right? And so when you look at, so like I said, so when you look at racism and money, you're looking at it where you have a period of history or even up to now where one, it's impossible, nearly impossible for you to build wealth. Secondly, on your way to doing it, there's a, a, as they say, right, life ain't no crystal stair, right? So you got all the cracks, the bumps and everything else that you have in order to obtain it, which is extremely difficult, right? And also you're playing a different game, right? You're, you, you're walking the clean legal game because remember there's even racism when it comes to crime. Tell me, Tell me what crime can black men commit that will ultimately become a multi-billion dollar sport. Right. So that's how isn't that how NASCAR got started, you know, with the with the with the alcohol, uh, you know, with the uh, with the with the guys smuggling alcohol out driving the cops. And then from there you get into NASCAR. So the so the whole thing, the fact that our criminals. Right. So. You know, like I said, the Kennedys are bootleggers. So, you know, Bumpy Johnson was never given the opportunity for two or three of his generations to take his crime money and go legit. Right. I mean, it's the same thing one could argue, I mean, for Trump. I mean, not to say that his uh, father was uh, directly connected to uh, the mob, but I mean, we do know that he did have some connections to the mob and that uh, some of his business dealings were less than... uh, (laughs) <laughs> you know, uh, uh, honorable uh, to some extent with the way that he, uh, you know, the way that he dealt with the uh, government and the kind of loans that he, that he was able to procure. You know, so, some say that there was a little bit of shady deal in there. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I get, you know, all of the guys in New York who uh, were able to cash in on these, uh, you know, these drug trades, they were never able to at all in in any nah, man, they locked them dudes up in the nineties, man. I saw my own two. <laughs> they <laughs> they took them dudes clean off the streets, man. Rico charge, right? And, but you know what's funny about that is, so and I just want to say something about that, and then, but I don't want to be stuck on that. So the Rico laws were initially uh, created to bust up the Italian mafia and the Italian mobs, but once that machinery yeah. had already, you know, been established. Uh, and, and all of the mechanisms by which to infiltrate those uh, 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 illicit rackets uh, were, were in place. They just took the machinery and used it against black people. And it was easier, I mean, because of course, these black kids, I mean, they were kids, man. They, they couldn't have been any more than like 25 years old uh, starting these these uh, drug empires. And we all know, you know, the, the, the catastrophic impact it had on uh, 
urban life in New York and in other places on the East Coast. And it, it would eventually end up spreading during the early 90s and the late 80s. But I mean, these guys were never able to hold on to that capital and to do something productive with it because, you know, most of the time, these guys, man, are just young, dumb, and, you know, they are ambitious. Uh, they just were ambitious in a way that, uh, you know, is, is less than uh, considered to be honorable in, in our culture. But, I mean, white guys have done it. Japanese people have done it. The Russians have done it. You know, the Irish have done it. Jews have done it. Right. But we don't hear that kind of lasting negative stigmatization applied to those groups the way that it's applied to black people. You know? Yes. Yeah. So like I said, so that that's what I'm saying, because, again, you got to remember. Right. So <laughs> the Boston Tea Party. Right. Or the American Revolution was not considered legal. Right. <laughs> to, you know, for the laws again, for the laws at the time. Right. Right. So, you know, so so the. You know, criminality, <laughs> criminality is at the core of what we are. Like when you had that discussion, man, sh you know, said sugar, <laughs> like to your very point, you know, again, the value of sugar and spices makes crack look like a child's game in terms of money. Right. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like I said, so, so in terms of money, so when you... And, and that's what I'm saying. So when you when you look at the racism and the money aspect, so what happened was, you know, everybody else could come up committing crimes except for us, right? And then, okay, you know, everybody could come up, you know, getting loans from the bank and buying homes and all of that stuff, again, except for us. So at the end of the day, when it comes to money, career, physical play, when you look at every pie on this, uh, on this circle graph chart, whatever you want to call it, right? When you took on global white supremacy, you were squeezed out of that game. Right. 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 So you like you weren't even you weren't even on the board. So when it comes to so like if you're playing Monopoly and you're the shoe, you're not even on the board. You're not even sitting in that go. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so when people and so and this is what I'm trying to say. And so what happens is is that and that's why for us, right, that's why people like you, TSR Johnson, BGS are needed, because what happens is, is that you have, like I said, racism, global white supremacy. Remember, it has stratospheres. Right. And so based upon what your socioeconomic status is, you are going to experience it in different ways. And so and just because and so at the end of the day. Just because we're black, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that you're going to understand. A lot of us do not understand what racism looks like for uh, Jay Z or um, his name is at the tip of my tongue. The uh, uh, another black billionaire, the one that just ended up uh, fighting uh, fighting Hollywood or, or the cable companies, Byron right? Allen. Yeah, Byron Allen. So a lot of us, so if, if I'm in his shoes, if I was in his shoes, I would probably have people tap dancing on my brain 24-7 and I would have no idea what's happening to me. Because at that level, I probably can't comprehend what it is. Right. So what you know what I'm about, saying? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So what I'm about to do briefly is uh, open up some questions uh, to see if there's anybody in the chat. Uh, wants to join in and have you answer any questions they may have, and uh, and I also want to thank Black Dog for becoming a new member. Really appreciate that, bro. And look, you too can become a member of the Green Gorilla channel. All you have to do is hit the join button next to the subscribe button, and you can become a member. Memberships are precious; they're helpful. They help me to keep things going, uh, and they help me to uh, you know provide you with some good content. And also, I want to uh, give a shout out to Mark Swift. He just gave me a, a donation, and I want to thank him for that token of appreciation. So um, if anybody would uh, like to uh, ask my brother Sandog here any questions, we're going to continue on with the conversation. But if anybody would like to ask him some questions uh, or, or, you know, you have an opinion to share, uh, that would be it would be now, you know, the time to do it. So. Uh, any, any, any general thoughts about this, man? Like we, we've been shooting the idea around about how, uh, there needs to be some sort of organizational structure that we develop or, or, you know, some sort of invisible empire type organization that we can found where that ties black men together. 
but yes, but but before you talk about that, I got a brother by the name of Linwood who wants to uh, ask you a question or wants to make a comment. So let's add him to the screen. Brother Linwood, how are you doing, man? How are you? I'm still learning. Oh man, look, I'm we're glad to be here to help give you any information that we can. Now, I have a question and a statement, but first is my statement. You know, as I told you in the last podcast, I'm a student of Neely Fuller Jr. and uh, studying the system of white supremacy racism. So people are money. We are the money. Money is the, the tool of economics. N economics is not the tool of money. So with that being said, the question is, now that we know that we are victims of white supremacy in the areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, what do we do on our part to counter that onslaught? All right, so we got a, we, we, he's got a question for you, my brother. Thank you, man, for coming in and uh, joining us. You're welcome. So, uh, yeah, man, what do, you, what do you say to that, Sam? You know, uh, uh, again, you know, here, here's the thing, and I'm gonna be very honest with you, right? A lot of things are actually easier said than done. And so when you, you know, again, one of my old skill sets is that I'm a battlefield commander and most battlefield commanders should be students of history, right? Because there's nothing new under the sun. And there are many things that you can learn from previous wars in order to, um, uh, in order to find solutions in terms of what you're dealing with now. Uh, so one, and again, I, I'm going to talk in a very vague term and then I'm going to go, I'm going to go specific. Right. So, you know, uh, in the last conversation, right, you had the nameless protagonist in GG talk about how it took Germanic peoples 800 years to take Rome down. Right. And so, you know, you ha you would have the vandals where you get the word vandalism and everything else and stuff like that. And that's something to study. But the biggest thing that I will tell you that we have as an example is you have. Japan and China. And I promise you, I'll give you, I'll lower it down to a, mac, a micro example. But look at Japan and China. So what did Japan and China do? <laughs> Japan and China said, okay, Western world, you say the standard is 100 points. So China and Japan send their children to Western institutions, right? They send their kids out into Western institutions. And not only did they get to 100, but they surpassed 100, right? So if you achieve a standard and then you surpass that standard, then you yourself become the standard. And Gigi could tell you just as well as I could, when we were kids, you know, it was popular for your dad to have an American car, Ford, Chevy, Lincoln, whatever, right? And Back then, if if your if your parents drove a Datsun, right, you know, you would be considered, you know, you would be considered, uh, you know, again, not living up the par. So what happened from 1985 to 1995? Datsun becomes Nissan. Nissan has a luxury line called Lexus, right? And then all of a sudden, Lexus Land Cruisers and everything else is in every rap song, and, like I said, in every rap song that you hear. Right. And so when you look at so when you look at what many Asian countries come and I'm talking about on a micro perspective, and I know there's a lot of nuance into it as it pertains to us. But on a macro perspective, what many Asian countries did was that they looked at the Western world and they dissected it. They did not engage in the hedonism of the Western world. So what would happen? So, for example, and I told my Arab friends the same thing. You, you know, uh, you know. You'll go buy a Mercedes Benz, bring it back home and show your friends, look at what I got. You know, admire the dress that I bought my wife from England. But what a Chinese or Japanese man will do is that they will buy that car and they will crack it open and they will seek to rebuild it. And first they'll start off with a lot of mistakes and then they'll get something that works and then ultimately they'll get something better. Growing up in New York City, I used to see Chinese women come into Macy's and go into the and go to the high end section of Macy's and they would take a dress, try it on, take pictures of it, write down what it was made of, <laughs> write down what it was made of and then go and walk out. Right. Mm -hmm. And so and so what happened was, was that for them, they had the mindset and the culture of. Uh, 
of being producers, right? And so, so they're in history. So they're in history. You kind of have an example, like I said, again, of a way out. Now, there are other, other nuances, as in them being invited into the World Trade Organization. I get it, right? So now when, you, when it comes to us and you're looking at this pie chart, right? So let's, let's take something like controlling your physical environment right? So you want to control your physical environment. And so what happened, remember what I said before, a lot of us, Republican, Democrat, conscious, or whatever in the middle, the problem that we have is that we do not know how to compartmentalize information for our benefit, right? So when you're looking at politics, strategy, money, etc., look at it like your human body, right? I'm going to eat an apple, my body is going to use some of the apple and then the rest of the apple is going to be eliminated. But what happens in our community is a lot of us are fighting to make the entire apple nutritious and that will never happen. Right. So a lot of us are fighting to make a bag of Doritos nutritious and that will never happen. So a bag of Doritos, an apple or an orange all give you very different things. So and if you're looking at so now, now down to us in physical environment. So if you're looking to control your physical environment, right, you got apples, oranges and bags of Doritos. And so like your body, you're going to have to be able to compartmentalize who can give you what in order to facilitate your agenda, right? So there are some of us who could sit in city council meetings and watch C-SPAN all day, every day, right? And hey, they're looking to pass this bill or they had a zoning board committee and they're looking to bring in a factory here and do this and do that. Do we want it? Do we don't want it? And how does it benefit us? Right. And then as Gigi was saying, in terms of a quote unquote organization for black men, again, the history is there. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Your street gangs are right there. Right. Your street gangs are right there. The a lot of these guys are the descendants of the original Black Panthers. Right. And so, again, so through your church, your mosque or whatever, you could reach out to these guys. You could start to counsel and mentor and then you could you can sublimate and then you could organize them back into what the original intent of these organizations were, which is to protect the community. Right. So if I, I'm, I apologize. It's, it's a long winded answer. But. Ultimately, what I want you to get out of it is that we are not in an impossible situation. But what happens is, is that we have to stop the infighting. When you have an objective, there are multiple avenues of approach. This is what we call it in the Army in terms of war when you want to seize an objective. you got main supply routes. You have avenues of approach. So there's a lot of ways to get to what you're going to. What I would encourage us to start doing is that we have to have the ability to compartmentalize, right? So stop thinking that you can get all your nutritional needs from an apple or a banana or anything else. And I hope that answers the question. Okay, that's a good that's a good answer. Uh, so we, we have a brother named uh, Caleb who wants to ask you a question or wants to make a statement. Brother Caleb, are you there with us? Yeah, can you hear me? We can definitely hear you, man. All right, cool. Thank you for going to the show. Uh, all right. Question, brother. Yeah, I got you. So 21 years old, uh, not from a predominantly black family, but I am black, but uh, adopted. But what what that does do is nothing really, but it shows that it doesn't really matter. Right. So going off your point, right, big ideas, at least what I've seen from other people is like it's hard to produce. So it's easy to let them go, especially, you know, what we talk about in the community. So, you know, you know, what I'm doing right now is programming, right? And trying to make a business. Um, and that's something that's huge right now is tech, like natural resources, hand labor, jobs and agriculture. But like, sometimes I feel like, sometimes my friends are like, think too abstract of like, like, oh, I want to do entertainment instead of doing something real. And just kind of, I mean, that's more prideful than, you know, selling t-shirts for like your rap career, you know what I'm saying? And that's why I feel like sometimes we get into this cycle of being like, oh, I want to make it big instead of being like, well, really put in the work for a product that like no one else has thought of and really, you know, put a dent in the universe. But that's really what I want to say. Good thoughts out there. And uh, it's really and also going back to your point of connections, I think looking to your sons and stuff like that and educating them instead of like society is strong. Um, but again, I'm only 21 educate myself. So 
that's all I got to say. Thanks, guys. Hey, thank you a lot, Caleb. Uh, do you have any response for that, my brother, uh, saying, dog? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, but, but, but that's what I was saying. We all have our place, right? So you're making your digital marketing or whatever that product is going to be. And what happens is those guys that wrap and make T-shirts and all of that, those are your filmmakers. Those are your marketers. Those are your salesmen, right? So, like I said, again, we we all have a place, and that's the thing, right? You can't you can't get caught up in the business. If you're an apple, right? If you're an apple, you're not going to make these bananas apples, right? And so, what you have to do is you have to compartmentalize and find out where you align. So, like I'm looking at what nameless protagonist said, right? So. Like, you know, again, in the when I was in the military, right, we called it intelligence preparation of the battlefield, which is what we're talking about now. Right. Which is step one is to define the battlefield environment. Right. Describe the battlefield and its effects. Evaluate the threat. Determine courses of action. Define the battlefield environment and its effects. Right. So this. So these are the four steps of IPB. Right. That's what we call it. Uh, uh intelligence preparation of the battlefield, define the environment, define the effects, evaluate the threat, and determine a course of action, right? And so when you, and so again, so when you go through this process and from that process, because we get mired, because when you're taking an objective, you have main efforts and you have supporting efforts. And so when you talk about this big thing called white supremacy, what happens is one of the reasons why we're confused is because a lot of us have no idea where to start. What area of life needs to be, what area of life needs to be engaged? And when you look at it from a big picture perspective, military wise, what happens is, is that within that main effort, so there's a main effort for your infantry and tanks, there's a main effort for your signal guys, and there's a main effort for your logistics guys. And so our inability to compartmentalize and organize is actually what's hampering us. You know, you know, that's funny because I, you know, I, I did a show the other day and uh, I talked about the ways or the various ways in which uh, justice is characterized by people in the Western world, okay? But I left out Plato's response to all of those uh, claims. Uh, but, but primarily, uh, you know, the response that Plato gives to uh, Glaucon, his brother, who basically argues it's better to do injustice and not suffer it but it's bad to actually suffer injustice, but to not be able to retaliate. So therefore, let's just, you know, develop a modus vivendi, which is like a little tentative piece, so we don't kill each other, right? Uh, but what Socrates does to try to respond to that is he makes the case that if you want to have a functioning society and one that is just, you have to have people performing work and doing their work and not interfering with the role of other people performing that work. So, so in other words, you're going to have a group of wage earners and, you know, they're going to be building homes. They're going to provide uh, culinary arts. They're going to uh, provide clothing, uh, all kinds of utensils and tools that people use in order to just function on a day to day basis. Right. And then you're going to have a military class or, or like, you know, like a, what he called them guardians. Right. And they were supposed to perform their function and not interfere with the function of the wage earners and what they do. And then there's going to be a philosopher class and they don't meddle with what the military personnel do and they don't uh they don't interfere with what the wage earners do. They do what they do and they become experts at what they do and they work together synergistically in order to bring about functioning and well-being in the context of the society. And I think all you're really talking about is having an overarching goal and having a division of labor in tackling or hand, handling various objects, fulfilling various objectives within the, within the context of a larger organization. But it's so hard for us to do that because uh, we have a hard time seeing how working together, uh, as opposed to each individual working for his own self-interest, we, we have a hard time seeing how working together could actually be a benefit to us. And that's a shame yeah. because you know, nothing happens if, unless we do things together. And I, I think that's the, like the lost art of Western culture. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't do very much together. I mean, our organization does things together uh, and we have a set of mandated programs that each year, I mean, if there's an undergraduate chapter or a graduate chapter, they try to fulfill those objectives. And some chapters do better 
and, and some do worse at, at uh, bringing those objectives about and fulfilling those, you know, uh, requirements related to those programs. But I mean, everybody has their role to play. There's like stratification. People, different people hold different offices and they perform different functions. Somebody holds the, the money. Somebody watches the door. Somebody keeps all of the records. You know what I'm saying? It, I mean, it, it, this, we, 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 it's kind of like we lost the art of the division of labor and working cohesively as a team to uh, fulfill objectives. But we do it in sports. So we can carry that knowledge in sport from sports and apply it to other areas of life. So that's that's just something to think about, man. Yeah, uh, but you know what, Gigi? I, 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 I'll take it from another observation that I feel personally, right? As they say, because again, you'll laugh, but a while ago, my goal was to become president of the United States. It's not a laughable goal. Observation no. of American society was in fact, well, it was twofold. It was that it was because the country failed to remedy things like racism or other types of wrongs, ultimately the country will become both lawless and ultimately leaderless, right? Because people will break down into political tribes, right? So people will break down into political tribes and then now, now you will never be able to achieve a, a mutual consensus, right? Because there's no longer you no longer have a unified standard that the country based itself upon. And so my argument would be is that racism, like, because I remember reading the book of Pat Buchanan, right? And I think it was called Suicide of a Superpower, something to that effect. And Pat Buchanan was saying that in his book that, you know, that the civil rights movement kind of broke the bond, the, the band of America, it, it, it kind of broke uh, a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot of philosophies or institutions or ideologies or whatever existed that actually held America together before, right? And so, and it goes back to the conversation that we had about how not dealing with Black men in a fair and equitable level has it, it, it kind of opened up Pandora's box, right? And so, okay, I want to take black men, but in order to ignore them, I'm going to attach all these other movements and everything else to take attention off their mistreatment or for me to just ignore them altogether, right? right, right. And so now what happens is you got those other groups, right, who've taken the African-American civil rights movement and ran amok with it. And they ran amok with it to the point where you reach the point in America where you can't establish a standard on anything. So if you seek to establish a standard on what marriage is, you're a bigot. If you want to establish a standard on, you know, what education should be, you know, what should be taught, you're a bigot. So, so what happened was from my perspective, that at that point in our history, right, that kind of from or or from what Pat Buchanan is saying is that that kind of broke the moral bond of the country. Right. And then since then, you haven't had you haven't had a leader that could actually give the people purpose to put these things aside. Right. So Donald Trump has said it conceptually that nothing unites people like success. But sad and most unfortunately, uh, a lot of his rhetoric doesn't suggest that. So, so, you know, to me, when you look at the United States or the Western world as a whole is living off a of past glory, right? Idle hands of the devil's workshop. So the society has nothing to do, but, but pretty much drown in the pool of decadence, right? So you're, so there's, if you got a leader who says we need to modernize American infrastructure and we need to go to Mars and that's the focus of the society, right? So if that guy or woman was able to pull it off, that now gives the society a unified purpose or a unified goal. And then you could kind of start to bring people back together. But if the society is just kind of drifting aimlessly and you have an environment where people are splitting into all these little groups and everything that we have now, you're headed for disaster. And, you know, just to say something about that, you know, I've always said this. And I'm not going to even speak the, the language of the fraternity in order to express it. But there is, you know, I'll just start off with the ad aspera. But, you know, I, I, that's, yeah. all, that's as far as I'll go with it. But I mean, you know, I've always told people, man, if you 
if you shoot for the, the stars, you'll at least land on the moon. I mean, yes. there, there's, there's no secret that, you know, the, the wars, uh, the war efforts that we were involved in, like during the first and the second world wars, there were a period of technological advancement in Western culture and society precisely because they had to have done it. It was an externality of the war. Now, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, advocate for war, you know, as an excuse to, to develop technology, but all I'm saying is if, if the society at large doesn't have a goal that is orientated towards, then people aren't going to get busy doing creative things because it is going to just be kind of wandering aimlessly. So you got to have some sort of aspirational goal to reach out for. And when you reach out for that goal, even if you don't attain that specific goal, you'll at least hit other markers. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. So, but we got, yeah. another, we got another brother here. Um, black. Oh, hold on. I took him off. And I keep taking them off and on. I'm still here, bro. I'm still here. Black to the film. Yes, uh, I'm still here. So you're going to be the last comment to, uh, on today's show. Uh, okay. Would you uh, give us a comment, ask a question, and then after that, we're going to kind of close the uh, remarks. Okay. Well, I just have a comment. So my comment is that I, I understand and I appreciate you guys' time, but I was thinking, you know, um, and you always talk about Plato a lot. I don't know. if you, have you Have you read the allegory of the cave? Because oh. I think that I think that for black people, that's where we're at, right? We're the prisoners inside this cave, right? And what I mean by that is like we know what the problem is, but what's the solution to that? Is that we're not really looking at reality. We we have an assumption of what the reality is, but there's a reality we can't comprehend. And I attest that to the fact that I, as, as I told someone, this is a game of nations or a game of or a game of countries, right? And black Americans are the only ones without a country. Everybody else is prospering and they have one unique proposition in common. They all come from a country. We don't actually have a, a, a country. So, you know, when, you, when, when, when we talk about this problem, it might just be that we need to be a nation. It seems like everybody's respecting their nation and not their identity. And we just have an identity. And I think that's where we fall short. And as long as you remain these prisoners in a cave, looking at these shadows behind us and thinking that's the reality, you know, because I think another brother came on here and he was like uh, talking about Nilly Filler, who I also follow. White, global white supremacy is never going to accept the black man. That's what, that's what the supremacy part is. They can't be, I, I see the pie chart and it's good. It reminds me of Marzalo's hierarchy of needs. But the thing about it is supremacy cannot have no competition. Like Nilly Filler, he made a good point. The problem why we don't have a black family is because a black family is in direct competition to a white family, which is supposed to be supreme. And, you know, but that's what I got to say. I think um, I think if more people understood our circumstances and, and, and start talking about let's get a nation within this nation, maybe we could be a, 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 um, a pictorial or something like that. But we need to have a nation to deal with these people of other races that have nations behind them. Chinese, we talked about the Chinese. They got a nation. All these Anglo-Saxons, they got many nations, you know. The the uh the 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 Africans that immigrant here they come from Ghana Kenya Nigeria they have a nation South Africa they have a nation Black Americans can't go to the White House as Black Americans we have to go to the White House as this nation you know but that's all I gotta say. Okay, so uh, thank you, brother, for your uh, contribution, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna let you uh, feel that question, saying dog, and then I'll follow up with what I have to say about it. And then uh, we'll get okay. we'll, we'll close out. But but that's what I'm saying. So for example, again, when you go to war, you don't go to war with the army you want. You go to war with the army you got. And one remember, I talked about compartmentalization. And one of the things that you got that we need to understand is that there's no such thing as perfect allies. And I think that a lot of times for us, we are, are we are looking for utopian answers, right? And and, and that's not going to happen. Uh, anytime soon. And so when you look at it again, like, like what he told about other people have nations and actually you do have a nation. There's something called a pan African movement, right? Again, you know, started, like I said, started by Marcus Garvey, right? And so again, so you, you have the ability to help develop a culture. There are Nigerians, Liberians, Ghanaians, and everything else that can actually 
help us, you know, reconnect to the motherland. It's sad and most unfortunately because it got a bad stigma, again, like what you will call your quote unquote uh hotep dudes, right? And it goes back into it goes back to um what Walt Diddy uh was talking about in terms of propaganda, in terms of how you see yourself. All of this stuff didn't happen overnight. So when BGS talked about the Prussian school system, right? So remember, it took hundreds of years for people to be taught and to think within these types of, uh, within this type of manner, right? And so at the end of the day, if you were to have, if you were to have quote unquote, like your own black films that communicated family. So for example, now, right? So for example, now, you'll see a lot of black media that has another agenda uh, pushed into it, right? So whereas is that, you know, once you get in the film, so for example, think about it, right? Why did you think when you looked at the news, why did you think that so many conservative columnists or, or pundits had issues with Black Panther? Why, <laughs> right? Because Black Panther was dangerous in the sense that it had this whole concept of Wakanda, right? What could black people achieve had they been left alone, right? So whether it's Black Wall Street, Rosewood, Seneca Village, right? You know, when we, when we talk about something that's unifying or a mission statement, or as, as Gigi said, what could bring us all together, again, that mission statement is all roads, or, or the slogan should be, all roads lead to Wakanda, right? Wakanda, like, you know, Wakanda, Wakanda is the goal. So, so at the end of the day, like, like you said, okay, the Chinese people are tied to China. These people are tied to that nation and everything else. And so again, you're not going to the war with the army you want. You're going to the war with the army you got and you need to work all. And that's what I'm saying. And that's why Black Panther was so powerful because it put out the propaganda of Wakanda in terms of what could black people achieve if they're not molested or messed with. Yeah, so, you know, in, 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 you know, in my view, uh, as it pertains to the allegory of the cave and black people being kind of mired and stuck into uh, a sense of stupor, I mean, that's what this whole red pill community is supposed to be about. In fact, if, if, if you look at the movie, The Matrix, and then you look up Plato and The Matrix at the same time, you'll see all kind of uh, articles pop up that will explain to you the relation between the allegory of the cave and The Matrix is, and how they're supposed to be philosophically equivalent in some ways. And then also, you also find references to Descartes, because Descartes had this idea of a uh, skeptical methodology in order to try to attain certainty within uh, you know, thought and coming up with clear, distinct principles to move on. And, you know, so, but I don't want to get into all of that, but I mean, but the point is there's supposed to be knowledge bases that come along with different levels of awareness and different, uh, stages at which you move out of the chains in the cave. Uh, the, the idea is to understand it initially. And, and this is just my viewpoint, man. Like, look, I am a descendant of a slave. Yeah, because my grandfather was, you know, born in Alabama and his father before him and his father before him uh, were slaves. It just is what it is. But I don't want to start off my history by thinking that I'm a descendant of a slave. Like, I, I don't think that there's any value in thinking, you know, or, or, or developing my identity around my experience as a slave. I might be a descendant of a slave. But I, like Rakim said in the song a long time ago, and I keep remembering, uh, you know, I keep uh, reiterating it. Remember, you're not a slave because we were put here to be much more than that. But we couldn't see what kind of mind was trapped. But, I'm, you know, I'm here to break away the chains, take away the brains, remake the names, reveal, you know, remake the brains, reveal my name. We can't keep mired in this idea that all we are is slaves. I'm not a Correct. fucking, you know, like I'm not a fucking slave. I just got to come out and say that. Fuck slavery. I'm not going to keep my identity mired in the fact that I'm a slave. Fuck being a slave. Fuck thinking about slavery. Fuck them people, man. I mean, you know, like, I, I, I'm not a slave, man. That's not the song. And then we got to have some idea about futurity. 
So we don't right now we you know we 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 keep looking back and back and I understand that there's some harm and trauma and, and we gotta figure that out. But at the same time, if we keep going over the tortured narrative of what we were in relation to being slaves, then what's the future? I, I, I put something on Facebook the other day and I said, you know what catastrophe is? Catastrophe is all that you got is a history that you were a slave and you have no more than like three months thought ahead of what you're gonna do next. That's catastrophe right there. Like if you can't think about anything three months ahead, and you all you got is this legacy of being like a slave then what do you have you have more of the same so we got to find a way to get over it because i don't i don't see white people doing anything to remedy it that's not what they do they don't remedy it global white supremacy is the antithesis of paying reparations or recompense for the harm that they did so we're going to have to use the environment we're going to have to try to find a way to use our careers. We're gonna to have to try to find a way to save money. We're gonna to have to try to find a way to maintain health and well-being, and to have healthier family and friend relationships, to have better romantic partnerships and to develop personal growth and to have different kinds of fun and recreation so that we can pull ourselves out of it. We're gonna to have to do it. We gotta work with the army we got. We gotta work with the circumstances we are given. We don't have any other circumstances. We don't, but we do have proof of a group of people biblically who are in the same situation that we were in uh and some people say that we are those people the jews it doesn't matter if you can identify yourself as those people or not but the whole thing is those people lived in greece they lived in egypt they leave they lived in rome they lived everywhere they lived in germany according to you know the the, the contemporary uh ideal so we have to pull ourselves out of this shit and we have to be crafty and we have to use the terrain that we're in and freak it just like you were talking about with like the japanese we have to learn how to be reverse engineers we have to set a standard and we have to be higher than the standard and we have to make people respect us even when they say that there's nothing respect respectable about us now i know that might hurt some people off but i'm straight up no chaser i'm the green gorilla you know what i'm saying i'm the phd right now but my the g in me is like fuck these people man I, I, you yeah. know, still I rise. I'm the rose that grew from concrete. I got to keep pushing. You know what I'm saying? I'm like Tupac. You know what I'm saying? Fuck that shit. You know what I'm saying? These people, yeah. I'm a hell raiser. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. I, I, I'll tell you this because I'll tell you the most gangster thing I saw, right? So you're, you're at the height of the war on terror in the early 21st century. Oil is more than $100 a barrel, right? People in America are paying $40 to fill up a Camry right and so you're at the hot and so you have all of this anti middle eastern media happening during the war on terror in the united states and i saw the president of the united states secretary of state and the vice president all asked saudi arabia one by one all asked opec one by one to lower the price of gas and opec said no Right. Here you are <laughs> in the Middle East having a war, tearing it up. <laughs> and when they asked for a discount on those oil prices, all the rhetoric, they said no. And guess what? As a country, we had to live with it. Right. So, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and it goes back to what you said in terms of the acquisition of power. Right. In terms of in terms of looking to obtain power so justice could be facilitated. So what did you say, right? You know, if I have the power to screw somebody over and they can't fight back, that in its of itself is a form of justice. So what happened recently, right? You had an Arab nation tell Nigeria, hey, you know, coronavirus, or whatever, your people are banned, you can't come here. And Nigeria turned around and said, oh, that's dope. Well, guess what? Your airline can't come here, right? And then all of a sudden, they're in a the newspaper, we're going to reconsider our stance on allowing Nigerians to come into the country, right? Because, again, if you understand Africa, Nigeria, for the most part, is the black superpower in Africa. It's the most populous state in Africa, right? And Which makes it highly influential. So, if you so if Nigeria is starting to become conscious of its power, right? And so what so 
if Nigeria is becoming conscious of this power and probably at some day will be able to influence whether you can participate in the economy on the continent or not, if that nation lives out to its potential. So guess what? They're the last group of people that you want to piss off. And that Arab state, they reversed course. They turned that speedboat on that decision faster than you can blink. Once Nigeria said, yo, if we can't go there, your airline can't come here. And, you know, it's the same way, like, with politics in America. Instead of just always defaulting to the Democratic Party, we can switch up and change it. Like, okay, you, you guys don't want to play nice? Fuck y'all then. You, don't, you, you, you want to, you know, have policies that don't benefit black men? Fuck y'all as a, as a party then. And, like, everybody will begin to, like, adjust to it instead of people just automatically doing what they've been doing. I mean, it's hard to get out of canalized thought. And it's hard to get out of canalized actions. I mean, habits are hard to break, but they can be broken. And it, there are contexts in history in which people who were lowly rise up and become dominant on the world scene. You look at the white people, they did the shit within the course of four or 500 years. I mean, their ascendancy yeah. is... It's, and, it's, and it's, in the it's, ancient it's, world, they were considered lowly, correct? They were barbarians, man. They were the scum. Like Rome talked about these people really bad. They were savages. I mean, you know, that's how they were discussed. Cretans. I mean, you know, no, no respect whatsoever. And so, uh, and, and oddly enough, uh, people from Africa were held in high regard by Greeks. I mean, they were called like the blameless, uh, ho most holy of men. And it, like, how, did, how, how do the tables turn? You know, so. Correct. Uh, but, but, you know, this, this is how things go. I mean, nobody's up forever. Nobody's down forever. You know, uh, but, you know, you have to be the catalyst for change if you want it. And, yeah, it's going to be difficult and you might not see it come to fruition in your lifetime. But you could be proud of the fact that your legacy, you know, if you start one, can be carried on to the future. If you create an institution or if you create a practice under a set of ideals and that other people can come along and you can see young men hold that tradition up and make progress. We do it in the fraternity all the fucking time. We see young guys, man, who like 20 years ago just had players and we brought them over and not look at them. They running shit, you know what I'm saying? Got good jobs, good families. And then you see them bringing in young Neos, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. you, you can look and like, I, that's my fucking Neo. And then, you, and then they look at each other with this pride and then people know your name and then there's honor related to it. That, it's the same thing yes. we need to do, but but we need to bring it down away from higher education and make it accessible to everyone. You know what I'm saying? Instead of being elitist and that talented TIFF mentality, we need to create these kind of institutions for everyone, especially for black men, so we can have rites of passage and so we can have, you know, the, these traditions, these bridge building exercises where we're not doing it all alone. And then like, yeah. like tackling the problem. Yeah, the tackling the problem is not so difficult when you got like-minded men attacking it. You see what I'm saying? So, but that's just it right now. It's just in this formative idealistic stages, but it's not impossible. It's not, I don't think anything's impossible, but that's just me. I'm an optimist like that. So see, uh, <laughs> I'm not against you, T. And for me, that's my idea. Absorb the games, right? So like I said, look at what other people are doing. So if there's a school to, if there's a school to prison system, then we have to counter that narrative, right? So like I said, we, we would have to, we would have to counter that narrative. You know, th there are tons of things that we can do. So it's the same thing. Like, you know, hey, you know, uh, you know, we, you know, we live in this community. So like on my, so for me, on my line, quite a few of my guys were educators, right? And so a lot of them, a lot of them, you know, went on and went into the field of education to, to impact the lives, uh, to impact the lives of, uh, of young African men in the communities where they're at, right? And then some of them, some of some guys now are even principals and superintendents. Right. So, I mean, you know, so, hey, it ain't impossible, man. Like, but this is something we have to do. There is no other alternative. The other alternative correct. is to just roll over. There is no, correct. There is no alternative to me. There's no, oh, no. we can't do that because, no, there, because at the end of the day, excuses are monuments of nothingness. They build bridges to nowhere. You know what Correct. I'm saying? I mean, it, it is what it is. 
So, yeah. and, and that was the thing. So, for example, like I saw people on my Facebook page. So, like, you know, you they're, you know, they're like, OK, for all you Trump supporters and Trump is doing this platinum thing. And, you know, you know, don't be a sheep and don't do that. And like I said, this this is an uh, inability to understand power. So what ha- remember, there's no such thing as a perfect ally. So if 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 Trump is going to expand opportunity zones, then that is your opportunity to create banking infrastructure, right? And then that banking infrastructure is how you get entrepreneurship. And that entrepreneurship is how your how your uh, community gets jobs and everything else. And so what, what happens is, is that, like I said, so, hey, uh, Apple has a certain amount of nutritional value and a banana has a certain amount of nutritional value. There's no one food that you're going to eat that's going to give you all your needs. You're going to have to eat different things. And so I think that, like I said, so, you know, just, and that's just my main point in all of this is that we have to understand that power is compart is compartmentalized, right? And then understanding how we were pushed out of power in order to obtain it. There you go, my brother. So, you know, we're going to close this up, man. Hey, saying, dog, man, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, team. And, and yeah. you know what? And Thank one- you. I'm a Democrat, man, not in terms of like being a Democrat in the party, but in terms of my ideals, man, in terms of my principles. So, you know, I I don't ever declare myself to be a leader. I think that what, you know, what men want, they should have a discussion about it and let the best ideas float to the top. And then they make a decision about what to do. And then they carry on from there. I mean, like one of the things that we need to do is we need to be democratic and have meetings and know the, you know, Robert's rules and, make decisions about things and, you know, set a budget up and, and move forward and actually do it instead of talking about it. And if, you know, people have like, uh, you know, trust issues or whatever the case may be, then, you know, you get an attorney and you let them hold the purse and nobody can get to it unless the, you know, the group together makes a, a formal or an official position. You know what I'm saying? And we can bar, you know, the, the money going to any particular one individual. It has to be in pursuit of some sort of collective aim you know what i'm saying like i i want to build a holy black priesthood you know what i'm saying well we make shit happen <laughs> you know what i'm saying it, it is what it is you know what I'm saying? that's that's how i feel about it but you know it is what it is man so um thank you so much for joining us sand dog and look thank you all for joining us and uh, you know i hope i didn't piss anybody off today because i wanted this to be more constructive than anything else but i just got a fire and desire man to succeed i want us to to do well I don't want us to falter and to fail continuously. I think we got it in us to make a push. You know, we, we've always had it in us. We've been through worse. Really? We've been Somebody through worse. Somebody said it couldn't be done. Yeah, they said it couldn't be done, but, you know, it got done, didn't it? You know what I'm saying? It I, got it was, done. He rolled his sleeves up and he got to it. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, okay, yeah. And then, I, you know, like I did it. You know what I'm saying? So, But, but at the end of the day, uh, I want to express love to everybody, man. This is, you know, uh, it's all about uh, having a productive conversation, man. That's all. And thank y'all, man. Yeah. And so uh, I'll be on again. Uh, Sand dog, we're going to have a conversation when this is over with. But I love you, brother. Thank you so much for your participation, Ooh. man. Thank you, Chief. All right, guys. Thanks, guys. All right, now. All right. Now. Y'all be good, people. I'll holler at y'all next time. And uh, make sure to watch Tia San Johnson's show tonight. He got a good show popping off at 7 p.m. So I'll let y'all. I know you play a haters gon' hate Cause I'm at the finish line And I'm in the first place I'm a winner And I know I'm never lose Cause I'm way too ahead of you do I know you play a haters gon' hate Cause I'm at the finish line And I'm in the first place
take it through the nose, put it on my mind, I'm a beast like Michael Jackson Thriller. Your boys are tripping, I ain't hearing check, you're speaking something. Don't do too much because your pussies always do it for me. Yeah, get it good, get it like I should, all the hate motherfuckers better keep it coming. Put them all in a bar, throw a bomb in that motherfucker, leave their body slumping. I know you play a haters, go hate, cause I'm at the finish line and I'm in the first.